বিক্রম আমরা তাহলে যাচ্ছি ঠিক আছে তো কবি হ্যাঁ তুমি এইখান থেকে লগ ইন করে না so hi everybody uh, today we are gathered here to <clears throat> celebrate the world microbiome day for those of you who don't know what the world microbiome day is here are a few introductory slides uh, the world microbiome day is uh, celebrated on june 27th it's from the year 2018 and the major players of this uh, you know celebration are the following the microbiome support funding and the uh, the microbiome apc microbiome ireland institute so they have received a big funding from the european horizon to study the microbiome of animals plants environment everything and on the, on this day and therefore they plan to celebrate this as a world microbiome day on june 27th to celebrate the achievements in microbiome research as well as the important role of the microbiome in human and environmental health yeah so this is the uh, this is the uh, schematics of the project that they got funded in the european union horizon research microbiome is everywhere not only in humans not only within us outside us it is everywhere in the aquatic animals and plants and from single celled algae in the agricultural soil and everywhere on earth uh now there is a concept of one health that is not only the hum human is important but also the environment the animals the plants and everything together it is called one health so this is the uh, you know schematics of the one health where there is a sustainability of the planet depends on the microbial diversity humans the food we eat the soil animal marine animals and also plants primarily in nib bmg we study the human health and now we are also beginning to study the microbiome diversity connected to human health and disease human microbiome research in nibmg a couple of labs have started the human mi microbiome research work in nibmg and many of the labs are also aspiring in future to study the host microbiome interactions so we study mainly the mi microbiome in maternal and child health in adverse pregnancy outcomes preterm birth neonatal stunting we also study microbiome in skin of the healthy skin and then atopic eczema psoriasis these are the autoimmune skin diseases we have uh, you know planned for studying the microbiome in cancer this is a very upcoming field and some of us have collaborated with some labs in imtech uh, to study the microbiome of oral cancer in in uh, along with them and uh, 
microbiome in complex uh, diseases. We study diabetic foot ulcers, and we are all also trying to study the, the uh, microbiome in the intestine of the uh, diabetes pa patients. There, there, there are some labs, and uh, the one of the speakers will present uh, the SARS-CoV-2 microbiome that they have, uh, you know, uh, they have identified from the nasal swabs. Uh, today's World Microbiome Day talk will be given by Dr. Shondip Paul. He is the Associate Professor of the GIS Institute of Advanced Studies and Research, Kolkata. And we will also have, this will be followed by two research presentations. One by Dr. Shuman Pine from uh, Dr. Onolavo Basu's lab. He is the project manager of the Genome India uh, you know, project. And from Moshumi Shorkar from our lab who is a UGC SRF, both will present the ongoing microbiome research from NIBNG. So before, uh, you know, asking Dr. Shondip Paul to, to present the microbiome day talk, I would like to introduce him. He is a PhD from IICCB and he did his PDF from the microbiology department from University of Washington in Seattle. Then he joined IICB for a period of time and presently he is working in the GIS Institute of Advanced Studies and Research. He is primarily a computational biologist, having more than 15 years of experience with the data analysis and understanding of the adaptive evolutionary mechanisms of the microbes through the use and development of different softwares. His work has also provided important insights to explore the adaptive evolutions that are required for the phenotypic di diversification of human commensal and pathogenic microorganisms. I seem to know him from, from this year on, on, onwards, and uh, you know, I thought it's a very good opportunity for him to visit our institute, to see our labs, and uh, we can start doing some collaborations along with him. Over to you, Sandeep. So uh, thanks a lot. Uh, for Namda, thanks a lot and uh, Shovik for uh, inviting me, giving me the opportunity. So uh, when Shovik uh, actually called me and told that uh, he's going to celebrate this uh, World Microbiome Day, so I readily accepted that thing. So I mean, uh, uh, microbial world, so um, uh, I'm working from uh, my PhD onwards uh, in different aspects of uh, microbes. Like uh, in PhD, I work with the extremophilic microbes. So microbes which can actually thrive or survive in extreme conditions like very high temperature, high salinity, etc. So uh, we at that time uh, were fascinated to understand uh, their genomic and proteomic adaptations in order to survive in that extreme condition. And then I uh, uh, went to USA and I joined a microbiology lab. And uh, there also I worked with uh, uh, pathoadaptive mutations uh, in case of uh, microbes. And uh, at that time I realized that previously we, uh, I actually working with the single microbial community, I mean organism, something like that. But at that time, I realized that uh, it's not the single microbe who is uh, sustaining in a particular environment or in initial. It's a community of microbes. So uh, at that time, I uh, got interested uh, into understanding the different features of this microbial ecosystem, you can say, in different part of our body and also uh, in the world, uh, in uh, ocean, in uh, soil or something like that. So. Today, uh, I'll be talking about the microbes, and I think you uh, know about these things, yes? Yeah, so uh, this is the, um, I took it from the Jurassic world, okay? So now the, we know that uh, the dinosaurs, they actually survived a long period of time in this uh, art. But 
if you think of the microbes they are actually surviving from very beginning okay and they are actually dominating uh, our space okay so the unfortunate thing is we cannot uh, directly see them okay they are everywhere but unfortunately we cannot see them we need special kind of equipments to uh, look into them and that's why they were kind of hidden to us but they are everywhere okay if you look at the water if you look at the soil uh, food plant everywhere you can actually find them so this is one of my very uh, i mean i like this slide so uh, this is the time when uh, antony von leeuwen hock he reports first the microscope and this animalcules okay the small microbes and he first observed the microbes from the oral plaque sample okay and from his own actually oral plaque sample first and uh, this is the time then there is a famous man robert cock okay first uh, implemented this agar plate so that we can grow microbes in uh, media okay and look into their phenotypic properties and then this is the microbial ecological experiments then the carlos famously attributed all the tree of life and then comes the fred sanger and carrie mullis and then the 16s a kind of uh, understanding how the microbial community looks like so this is the marker gene that has been used at this time and then the handelsman proposed the term metagenomics okay ensemble of microbial genomic material and then comes the era of the ngs okay so this is you all know about i mean this uh, pioneer institute is working with i think they have all these things here okay so uh, you know about all these things and this is the thing now we can actually uh, look for the uh, microbial community in a pretty i mean nice manner okay so uh, this is the microbiome how to define we know the microbes are there but the microbiome is the presence of the microbes like bacteria archaea fungi protists and their theater of activity okay so uh, with the microbial structural elements as well as the internal and external structural elements as a whole this microbiota and their theater of activity we can just call it microbiome and these are the methods uh, by which we actually reveal this community structure of microbes either by the shotgun metagenomics knowing uh, i mean just sequencing uh, the presence of all dna from any sample and looking for what kind of microbes are present there and what are different pathways present there so that we can get to know who are present there and what they are doing there and along with this is the more cheaper option i mean the amplicon sequencing option so 16s different variable regions are present in the 16s and based upon those variable regions Uh, you can identify the um, microbial community structure their abundance i mean uh, comfortably at the up to the genus level not at the species or at the strain level that only you can get by this method only okay but yeah this is the chief method and uh, i mean in depth uh, you can go and you can identify pretty rare uh, microorganisms present in any community so these are two things and this is the new paper i just two days ago i uh, just uh, got this uh, paper and you can see they actually uh, took advantage of uh, 25000 i mean uh, the metagenomic samples the sequence samples they collected from different sources and they they reconstructed 25 draft genomes okay including this uh, 2500 uncharacterized species from them and uh, they actually identified i mean look at the number 40000 putative biosynthetic gene clusters so look at the potential of the microbes present in the ocean itself okay and they actually considered the uh, oceans all over the world and they actually identified the a biosynthetic gene cluster rich lineage okay it's carrying like more than 15 biosynthetic gene clusters and you know these biosynthetic gene cluster they are really uh, important uh, kind of gene clusters in order to get the secondary metabolites antibiotics and other important things so this is kind of a new thing we are getting similarly in case of if you look at the soil level 
So think, look at the biomass of the microbes present all over the world. You know, these are the rainforests, uh, and you can see a uh, pretty huge number of microbial biomass is present. Okay, and most of them are actually bacteria and fungi, and uh, obviously uh, other viruses and protists are also there. And if you think for the soil, the soil biogeographical processes that can be modulated by the soil microbiome, they are playing a major role Okay, uh, in uh, maintaining the overall carbon cycle, nitrogen fixation and other things in the soil. And nowadays, uh, in case of plants, there are uh, plant growth uh, promoting rhizobials or microbes. So people are working with that. So these microbes, they used to stay uh, in nearby the plant's uh, root, and they are really important in case of plant health and uh, its uh, um, growth also. And now, in case of the humans, all you know that we uh, actually harbor, I mean, a uh, huge number of microbes in different body sites. These are the major body sites you can look at, the mouth, skin, gut, stomach, and vagina. And you can see at different body sites, the microbial composition is kind of signature pattern for that particular body site. Okay, it varies from body site to body site. And obviously, this pattern also varies from human to human based upon their food habit and the habitat and other things. And if we look the real, uh, I mean, the latest estimate of how many microbes are present in our body, it's about 39 trillion. I mean, uh, based upon a person uh, weighing about 70 kg. Okay, so it's about 39 trillion microbial, microbial cells, and we have around uh, 30 trillion. So it's like one is to one, something like that. Okay, so we are not alone. Okay, never think that, yes, we are depressed, we are alone. Never think that. You have lots and lots and, uh, I mean, you, what you can say, tenants or something like that. Maybe they are the real owner. Okay, I don't know. But they are there with you, okay? And if you think they are weighing, they are weighing around like 200 to 500 grams. It's, I mean, it's nothing, okay? So it's all about your, I mean, the skeletal muscle and other things. That's the uh, all weight about. But they are weighing about only 0.2 gram or something like that. And if you think in your uh, lifetime, uh, there is a dynamics of microbial, uh, composition in your gut mostly. You see, at the uh, uh, baby condition, I mean, uh, when you start the breastfeeding, the microbial composition of gut changes. Then you know, when you started the formula feed, the composition changes. And in the health condition also, whenever you use the antibiotics. So I used to think antibiotics like the atom bombs, okay, for the microbes present in our gut. Whenever you take the antibiotics, it's going to kill all the microbes present in your gut, okay. So that's the kind of thing. And uh, in health condition, in adult condition also, based upon your health condition, like whether you are obese or lean, so your gut microbiota will change accordingly. And if you see the bacterial diversity, I will talk about the diversity later on. So if you see the bacterial diversity means how many microbes are present in your gut, it actually varies from very beginning of your life to the end. Okay. So this is the most stable condition when we are mostly active, okay? So we are also stable, gut are also stable, okay? So this is the time when we lose our jobs and other things. So also you see microbes, I mean, they are going away from your body. So the thing is, and these are the important things they are doing. At the very beginning, they are doing the glycan foraging, vitamin biosynthesis, and later on, they are doing the oxidative phosphorylation, lipopolysaccharide biosynthesis, flagellar assembly. So these are the important things they are continuously doing in our body to make us happy, okay, to make us healthy, you can say. And uh, if you think about this, these are the few things uh, gut microbes do for us. It protects against the pathogens. Uh, it actually helps a lot to develop the proper immune system in our body. It facilitates the digestion, synthesizes vitamins, supplies nutrient and energy, induces development, metabolizes xenobiotics, and moreover, it contributes to the species evolution. Okay. And this is a, a nice thing I like it, the Anna Karenina principle. I mean, it's uh, taken from the Leo Tolstoy, Anna Karenina, that all happy families are all alike. Okay. 
and each unhappy family is unhappy in its own way so that's true for our gut microbes also okay all healthy gut looks more or less similar okay and all sick guts are sick in its own way means in different disease conditions we have uh, i mean microbial associated diseases we have different gut microbiota present in our body and that microbial change varies from disease to disease okay but in health condition that's more or less similar so you can think of a contoured surface where the health conditions are defined but whenever you are rolling a ball whenever it is coming from a defined health zone to other zones that is might be representing different disease conditions okay and i like this thing in normal condition the host genetics that's the most important thing this is our microbiome and this is the environment okay so they are in a i mean ohms okay three ohms are kind of running away so we call it eubiosis we are maintaining the ohms whenever there is persistent exposure in environment okay so this got disrupted and this is called the dysbiosis the microbial composition in your gut that got disrupted and there are maybe health promoting symbionts reduced and the invasive and inflammation inducing microbes increased and ultimately different disease state can appear okay so whenever there is these things so we have problem so now uh, in case of microbes as i told you earlier we can think of it's a microbial ecology present in our body in our gut if you see in this dark and cold sp uh, space lots of microbes are residing in different pockets okay so we can think of like a, a rainforest or something like that okay sometimes uh, foods are coming waters are coming and something like that okay so we use some ecological parameters in order to identify the diversity how different types of microbes are present there and how they are different i mean from one particular gut to other gut how the microbial composition differs so we use different ecological parameters like here you can see three different sites with different trees and if you just just calculate the number of species and that is can be represented as the alpha diversity okay that means this is the higher alpha diversity different kinds of species are present there and this is the lower alpha diversity you can think of so this is one measure we generally use higher alpha diversity means we have different types of microbes present in a simpler form and whenever you compare one site with another based upon the common parameters then we call the beta diversity that means it will give you the difference between one site to another site so for community community if we just want to compare the microbial composition we just uh, calculate this beta diversity to see whether there is fixed significant difference in the microbial composition is there or not so if you think about globally you can see in different parts we have different food habits different environment and you see they are if you think the beta diversity that is very different from different i mean persons from different continents and this is more or less similar to each other but if you go into it if you check here with here you will see the difference again okay so there is huge heterogeneity in the microbial composition and interestingly it has been found <clears throat> if you look at the bacterial diversity and if you calculate for the carnivores omnivores and herbivores you can see for the herbivores the diversity is, is maximum and for the carnivores the diversity is pretty less so these are the animals which have the most numbers of microbes present varieties of microbes present in their gut okay so and we belong to this category we are in between okay some of us obviously are like strictly carnivores and some of us are strictly herbivores so accordingly our gut changes okay and if you look the compositional changes in the gut microbiome during africa ape diversification this is the common ancestor now if you look this is the human this is pan this is a, a kind of a gorilla and uh, if you think these are the lost microbes 
from the common ancestor. And these are the gained. And these are also gained here and lost. So in course of time, we humans, we lost lo most of the microbes and we gained several other microbes. OK, so. And I mean, I just studied in different aspects and I found if you look at the schematic history of selective forces acting on the human microbiome. So this is our common ancestor. And look, this is the first we invented the fire. We started cooking. And that's the time mostly when most of the homo sapiens, they are emerging at that time with the cooking. And then we started the kind of farming. OK, and accordingly, the dietary component changes and our gut microbiome changes accordingly. And with the industrialization, we have heavy metals, arsenic in our water, and accordingly, we got different microbes present in our gut. Now, with the antibiotics, disinfectants, sanitation, bottle feeding, C-section, that's also changed our microbial community in our gut in several ways. And I think at present, this COVID for the last two years, I mean, staying in home, not, uh, I mean, uh, going outside and having particular food, the anxiety and so many things happened in our body and it should have some impact in our gut also. OK, and uh, so uh, that's and, and the alpha diversity, as I told you, on an average that is going down day by day. Nowadays, all the time we used to use the mask, OK, and used to use the hand sanitizers all the time. So we are actually protecting ourselves uh, from getting the horizontal transfer of microbes from the community. That sometimes is beneficial for us. I mean, for the kids, mostly it's very beneficial. But for the last two years, that has been stopped. OK, so I think that has a, some impact on our gut or human microbiome. OK. And uh, overall, uh, in course of this time, our gut community, the microbes, they actually um, got some resistance genes, heavy metal resistance genes, antibiotic resistance genes. So these things actually, these things worked as a selection force. And our microbes now actually have those genes which can give resistance to these antibiotics and the heavy metals. OK. So uh, and we uh, also looked, uh, this is a remote hunter gatherer. This is the traditional farming or fishing population. And this is the Western and urban industrialized population. And uh, with time, we are decreasing the microbial diversity. We lost most of the microbes here. OK, so now uh, we in India also kind of habituated with this kind of lifestyle. OK, so now all over the world, we are kind of by selected by the food habit. OK, and we'll be having the similar kind of microbes. And nowadays you can see lots of autoimmune disease and other metabolic disorders. Those are going up, OK, along with the other disease present. So obviously the good point is, I mean, with antibiotics and other things, we don't have the infectious diseases so much right now. OK, that was a, a pretty huge thing for our civilization. And you know the human microbiome in disease, I mean, different diseases like metabolic disorders, uh, liver diseases, inflammatory bowel disease, infectious disease, uh, cancer like uh, colon cancer. So those are people have found that role of biofilms in the colon cancer, how important the biofilms, they secrete a particular metabolite which actually facilitate the tumor cells in the colon cancer. So people have shown all these things. So now we know that these microbes which are present in our body, they are actually related with our health also. OK, and. Now microbiome based uh, therapeutics are there. One of the important thing is the fecal microbiome transplant and the diet and prebiotics. It is already there nowadays. You can see with the prescription of the antibiotics, doctor used to give the prebiotics readily available prebiotics. OK. And then the symbiotic microbial community, they are people are actually uh, producing the symbiotic microbial community. They are engineering the symbiotic bacteria so, so that it can go uh, in your gut and do the uh, required thing when your gut in, uh, is in the disbiased condition. And people are also working at the microbial uh, derived proteins and metabolites, specifically taking the proteins and metabolites instead of giving the particular microbes, 
they are actually extracting the protein required proteins and metabolites and giving directly to the gut. So there are different disadvantages. This is the kind of practice method nowadays. These two things people are using this diet, prebiotics, and the fecal microbial transplant. But these things are also coming in course of time. So now, uh, now if you look at these uh, proteins and metabolites. So if you just look at the microbes and their composition so it will not give you uh, it will just give you what kind of microbes are present there and what the, their functional potential is there along with that you need to i mean use other sophisticated technologies like metabolomics proteomics and other things and you have to integrate those things with the genomics so that you can get a system level understanding and for me uh, by training, I am a kind of uh, computational biologist. So uh, my kind of uh, aim is to uh, find out uh, uh, different algorithms, different techniques to tackle this huge uh, genomic or metagenomic data and fetch important insights from those data using different new algorithms or uh, different uh, tools. So uh, for this, uh, we developed the pancode gene. This is a pretty well known. If you have the complete microbial genomes, thousands or thousands of microbial genome, you uh, what you will do first, you will do the comparative analysis. And for the comparative analysis, the first one important thing is building up the pan genome. Pan genome is the total uh, genome set, genome repertoire of a group of organisms. I might be a genus, might be a species, might be some strains, something like that. And this is this part, suppose this is genome A, B, and C, this is the common part in all of them. We call it the core or conserved genome. And this is the accessory genome, which you can uh, distribute in uh, like unique. This is a unique genome present for genome A, and these are mosaics for the two genomes. So we developed uh, some uh, algorithms. Actually, this is a similarity based algorithm algorithm where you can define uh, <clears throat> the homology search threshold. Like I need 90% sequence identity and at least 90% length coverage. Based upon that, you define the orthologous sequences. And based upon these orthologous sequences, you can actually identify this pan genome. OK, and this pan genome is very important. Suppose you have a group of organisms for a particular body site, suppose for gut, and the same group of organisms you have from the oral cavity. Now we want to compare the organisms from these two uh, habitats, and you want to see whether there is specific genes or group of genes present in oral microbes or the gut microbes. So for this, you can apply these uh, pan genomes. And we actually did uh, a kind of uh, pan genomic and functional resource for the human microbiome. We considered uh, fully annotated genomes of around uh, 1,300 completed uh, genomes from different organisms. And we pre built this core, I mean, the pan genomes at different thresholds like 50% sequence identity, 60% sequence identity, 70%. So whenever you are increasing the identity values, so you are looking for very close related organisms. And whenever you are decreasing the identity values, you are looking for the diverse group of organisms. So this is actually here what we did. We included all uh, complete genomes from the human microbiome from different body sites, oral cavity, vagina, skin, gut, and we actually uh, considered them. Uh, you can see, I mean, uh, here the uh, taxonomy wise, you can consider the genomes the taxonomy wise. OK, you can consider the genome body site wise, and there is a module where you can do the comparative analysis. You just can take uh, four different groups there is uh, given and you can take any organisms in these four groups and you can do the comparative analysis. And what you will get, you get, you will get the pan genome profile, number of four genes and whether the pan genome is closed or open and you will get the cog distribution and also you will get the cake distribution means the functional potential also you can get for the core genomes, for the mosaic genomes, for the accessory or the unique genomes. So this is we implemented in case of lactobacillus. This is just for 
uh, we looked that uh, we got the lactobacillus strains from GI tract, uh, sorry, gastrointestinal tract and the uh, oral cavity and from the urogenital tract. And we compared them. This is the number of, uh, sorry, the numbers cannot be seen, but this is for the uh, total number of uh, proteins and this is for the uh, COGS and this is for the cakes. And you can see, I mean, there is a, uh, this is around like 1000 or something. There is, this is a core component. This is a lactobacillus specific thing, which is uh, commonly present in all lactobacillus strains, irrespective of their presence in different body sites. And these are the body site specific genes present in the lactobacillus strain. And we looked carefully that, and we found that uh, the core group, which is the most important lactobacillus specific group, and we identified their uh, different metabolic pathways present in the core group. And also we found some uh, uh, genes or group of genes, which is specific for the urogenital tract. Okay, so this, uh, this is freely available and we uh, build it based upon the MySQL and we implemented HTML, PHP and uh, mostly JavaScript, and this is freely available. Unfortunately, this is not, we are rebuilding it. Uh, it's not running anymore. We are rebuilding it and we are increasing the number of genomes. So we are targeting now for the 300, uh, 3000 or 4000 genomes, but all data is available with me. If you want, I can give it to you. And the next uh, important thing, that is the, just don't look at the composition. You also have to look at the function. Because if you see, this is the microbial community. At the community level, they actually do these uh, kind of things. Okay, so lots and lots of modified bile acids and the methane, acetate, phenols, ammonia, um, organic acids. So different things, I mean, this community can generate. Okay, and the interesting thing is that how to get idea of this metabolite potential of a microbial community from its genomic repertoire or its profile. Okay, so in general, what you can do, you can simply uh, do the uh, shotgun genomics and then along with you can do the metabolomics and you can get to know. But we actually implemented a new kind of uh, analysis platform from uh, by which you can use the 16S or Ampliquan sequences and you can predict at the community level what kind of metabolites it can give at particular condition. So we used, uh, this is also freely available. So uh, here we actually implemented this pie crust from Ampliquan sequencing to uh, create the metagenome. And from uh, pie crust, uh, we used the keg reaction map in order to identify the predicted relative metabolite turnover. So that kind of give you what is the metabolite potential of a particular community. And then we implemented learning based feature identification. What it can do, it can actually, uh, it can actually take the community structure, OTUID, and the uh, keg enzyme profile and the metabolite profile. And it will, if you define two groups, it will run the support vector machine model and it will identify the important features for two groups. Okay, and then using the contribution file from the PyCrest, you can link this OTU, means particular bacteria, to what enzyme it encodes and how the enzyme is connected with a particular metabolite output in the community. So, and uh, this uh, here, you only have to supply the biome file and metadata file. And if you have your own metabolite data, that also you can give, and uh, that will be later on compared with the predicted one, so that you can compare your predicted versus uh, real identification. And it will give you the normal alpha diversity. So uh, we used a queued system. Here you have to upload the data and give your email ID. And whenever the run is complete, you will get a notification and the results along with it. Okay. So here you'll get the all alpha diversity and the profile is the normal, the corona plot you will get for the different conditions and beta diversity you will get 
with the statistics and other things and also you'll get the uh, predicted uh, functional profile the pie crust functional profile also you'll get for different groups okay you can define in the metadata you can define differ two different groups and you will get all these uh, in one go you'll get all this information and along with you'll get the metabolites like this metabolite is pretty high in bacterial vaginosis so and this metabolite is pretty low in healthy condition so we actually utilized a uh, data and these are i'm coming to that and these are the features okay the feature will be identified accordingly for the community structure for the cake uh, enzymes and for the metabolites these are the features it will also give like in which group which uh, otus uh, means the microbes and which enzyme and which metabolite is uh, detecting as a feature so we applied this uh, on a bacterial vaginosis data they actually did the metabolomics along with the genomics so we use that thing and here you can see we identified this particular metabolite to be high in healthy condition we also got that thing and this is from our data we identified this particular enzyme is actually coming from these organisms so this is we we got from the contribution file so this is kind of trace backing we are doing okay so we only have the metabolite data and the biome means o2 file means the microbial compositional data so from here we can actually get to know what kind of uh, enzyme is responsible for this down regulation of this particular metabolite and who is the contributor organism for that and similarly uh, we also identified other organisms from utilizing this particular m2m platform so this is again freely available and i think i don't have too much time so last thing i'm going to see uh, show to you so this is we are recently we are doing so here our objective is like in fecal transplant also what happened uh, the major problem is whenever you do the fecal transplant from a healthy donor it sometimes happened that antibiotic resistance gene containing microorganisms are already present and if you transfer that fecal matter to a diseased uh, person so that will be i mean i mean you can understand what can happen so we were planning to identify the antibiotic resistance gene profile from directly from the metagenomic data from the raw reads okay from the shotgun sequences so for this we implemented a kind of machine learning based approach so this uh, we did uh, with our data science group so dr roshan banerji and dr koushik boshak and uh, myself uh, i mean uh, i am not so expert in this machine learning and these things so this artificial neural network so i just devised i mean we just told this is our problem and how to identify uh, the features uh, in the antibody resistant genes and based upon these features how to identify these uh, kind of uh, fragments from the metagenomic reads so here we took the card database you know card is one of the very uh, well curated antibiotic resistance gene database and this is in the preliminary form and from the card database we actually uh, took uh, 116 different drug classes okay and uh, we took the fragment length of 100 okay nucleotides from the database we took the uh, genes and we fragmented in in 100 uh, nucleotides because we uh, want to uh, implement this thing in the metagenomics data okay shotgun data so we are now trying to uh, reduce it more okay like 50 75 something like that and based upon that we use the testing and training data and if you see we got 22 different drug classes for which we have a huge number of fragment size and the machine learning experts can i mean they actually told us if you have huge number of training data then you will have a robust model you can predict more okay so for these 22 drug classes we have huge number of fragments but for all these drug classes we have pretty less number of fragments so our actually um, uh, this uh, model worked 
separately we uh, separated it in this part and this part we uh, trained these uh, with these 22 classes and then other uh, 94 classes here and when we trained these we found that for these 22 classes uh, which are the most important class i am coming to that we are getting precision and recall more than 0.8 which is not bad okay but for others we are not getting like 0.5 and 0 0.2 but for 22 at least, we are getting good uh, precision and recall. Okay, so and these are the drug classes. They are pretty multi-drug classes are there, pretty important drug classes are there. And then we looked at the features. Okay, uh, in those drug classes, like uh, these are the features we identified. Uh, we know that uh, this machine learning that actually identified these features. And when we looked carefully, so these features are actually residing in the antibody resistance domain itself. OK, so it's not coming from the other part. It's mostly coming from the domain. And that's a very important thing for us. OK, so that in metagenomic read, we can implement these things. OK, so and when we looked at these classes, what are the different microorganisms they are coming from? And you look here, Acinetobacter, Enterobacter, Estrella, Clepsilia, Salmonella. These are the notorious organisms. Okay, so they are commonly present in all of them. Okay, so now, uh, so we use this and the training data on the card itself. So we are actually working uh, in it, and uh, we are now take considering the metagenomic data directly. If we take the raw reads, uh, might be we don't. We are not sure whether we take the raw read or the process read. But our idea is take the metagenomic read and from here read we can give you the antibody resistance gene profile for that particular sample okay so this pan genome thing uh, can give you the comparative genomics uh, features and this knowledge based uh, system level integration of microbial composition and metabolite can tell you the overall system level understanding and we are working on this antibiotic resistance genes and uh, Rashuna and Kaushik, uh, we work together in these antibody resistant genes. And uh, Ovishek, uh, Unupom, uh, they are working into the, they've been on Unupom working the M2M and uh, Norden worked on the pan genome thing mostly. And thank you all for this. Thank you. Maybe if we are late, then we can continue. Questions at the beginning, we can talk about this. Hello, am I on? Yes. So, there's two questions regarding the uh, machine learning uh, model. Uh, the precision and recall that is for the training essentially. Is this for the test data? That's for the test data. So we distributed the whole data, 80% training, 20% test. And we, I mean, calculated all these uh, true positive and other things from the test data. And uh, how many features did you use for uh, how many features? So uh, I mean, uh, there was some, I think the feature importance was there. OK, I mean, uh, fragment wise, feature importance was there. So based upon that, we selected the top ones first. Before uh, training the model? This no, no, no. Uh, after yeah, after. So before, like we use the artificial neural network, I uh, no, no, no pretty less, but we encoded the ATGC data in different numbers. And based upon that, we trained the artificial neural network. OK, and we used, I think, uh, hidden layer of uh, 100, 400, and 200 neurons, and yeah. we use the ReLU model, actually. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so uh, thank you so much, Dr. Sandeep Paul, for this wonderful talk. So uh, our next 
Okay, so our next uh, speaker is Ms. Mosmi Sarka, and she joined NIBMG in 2019 as a PhD student, and she is currently working with Dr. Savik Mukherjee. Uh, so today she is going to talk about the role of vaginal microbiome in pregnancy outcome. Thank you, Ankita. So uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, greetings of the World Microbiome Day. So in this occasion, I'm going to deliver a talk on the vaginal microbiome in pregnancy outcomes. Microbiomes are the tiny living organisms that present in our body, and the different parts have uh, their own characteristic and which play important role in health and disease. Skin and mouth has more than 600, and uh, intestine has more than eight. Uh, sorry, skin and mouth has more than 600 and intestine has more than 8,000 microbes. Even vagina has more than 200 bacterial species in that. And uh, vaginal microbiome is differ from other parts of the body, which have mainly dominated by the lactobacillus, lactobacillus species and which uh, maintain the vaginal hygienity. But when this normal bacterial flora get altered with some non-commensal bacterial species, it can, uh, that can uh, lead some unhealthy vaginal conditions, which is called bacterial vaginosis. Uh, um, Vaginal microbiome does not remain same in female lifetime. If uh, when female are in pre-pubertic stage, their vaginal epithelium are remain very thin and they have very less amount of lactobacillus. But when they get into the reproductive stage, which is also called the premenopausal stage, then more and more lactobacillus start, start to grow in the vagina and they are become most dominant taxa of female re, uh, vaginal environment. So pregnancy is a part of the female reproductive power, uh, uh, in this phase. So even it is found that even during pregnancy, vaginal microbiome can alter. And it was found that this altered vaginal microbiome can lead some adverse pregnancy outcomes. So pregnancy outcome not for always blessed for all. So when baby's birth occur after 37 weeks of pregnancy, it's called term birth, and the these baby are seem to be healthy always. And when baby's birth occurred uh, at uh, before 37 weeks of pregnancy, they are called preterm baby, and they are mostly unhealthy. And it was reported that uh, nearly 44% infant complications are uh, due to preterm birth and India is the country with the highest number of preterm birth. Every year, 3.5 million baby born as a preterm birth and uh, uh, and they are more they are prone to have more illness in their future. So as I already mentioned, the altered vaginal microbiome is associated with the pregnancy outcome, but this microbiome is not same for all the ethnicity. Ethnicity can play important role in shaping vaginal microbiomes. So if we see the Indian scenario, so we can find some study already performed on the non-pregnant woman. From that, we can say there is a different uh, uh, microbial signature are found different parts of the India. But there is no such study. They will uh, help us to say there is a microbial difference in uh, uh, term and preterm vagina. So. This study is a part of the Garvini cohort, which is uh, situated in the Haryana, and it has a two phase, phase one and phase two. And the microbiome is one of the factor that NIBMG is uh, looking into that. It has uh, two objectives in phase one, uh, where we are looking into the differential microbial pattern in th different trimester of the pregnancy. Also, the longitudinal variation of microbes uh, microbes uh, during progression of the pregnancy from first to third trimester of the pregnancy. So this study has a uh, two phase uh, discovery and validation phase. Discovery phase had 20 term, 20 preterm mothers. And in validation phase, uh, we have a uh, 20, 120 preterm and uh, 120 term mothers. And uh, we have calculated this sample size calculation using this formula right hand sides. So from each of the study participants, three vaginal swabs has been uh, uh, collected. Then microbiome DNA has been isolated. Then uh, we have uh, sequenced the bacterial 16S RNA gene targeting V3, V4 region. 
to understand the bacterial compositions. Lastly, we have done some statistical analysis to understand understand what is the differential bacterial composition in term and preterm vagina. So in discovery cohort, total 120 vaginal swab sample has been investigated and we have found some lactobacillus species like lactobacillus crispatus gasseri are significantly higher in term samples, whereas we have found some uh, lactobacillus inners that is significantly higher in preterm samples. Besides this lactobacillus, some non-lactobacillus species also we have found higher, significantly higher in preterm samples. So these results are published in the Frontiers in Cellular Infection Microbiology with the collaboration of uh, uh, Professor Shinjini Bhatnagar and Dr. Bhavatosh Das, uh, THSTI. And this is the first study from India which showed differential mic vaginal microbiome composition in term and preterm delivering women. So uh, next our aim was to uh, validate our result of the discovery cohort in a larger number of sample size. So we have named this study as a validation cohort study. So these are the characteristic of a demographic uh, characteristic of study participants and we have found a period of gestation at delivery and infant weight are significantly different between term and preterm delivering mothers. When we are looking into the uh, diversity of bacteria in vagina in two groups, we have found vagina of preterm delivering women have more bacterial richness and more bacterial heterogeneity compared to preterm delivering mothers. And uh, in our study, we have found total 23 phyla and 418 genus. From that, we have selected some four phyla and taxa to do statistical analysis. For that, we have used some criteria. Like we have selected only those taxa who have uh, at least 0.1% relative abundance in any of the trimesters. So then we have uh, compared this taxa between two groups. And this is the result of the phylum level analysis. We have found Firmicutes is the highest abundant and the Proteobacteria is the second abundant bact um, phyla in our sample. So, and uh, we have obtained 19 code genera and this plot contain only the top 10 code genera I have plotted here. So we, from here we can see uh, Lactobacillus is the highest abundant genus in uh, term and preterm delivering mothers. So after species level analysis, we have found some lactobacillus taxa like lactobacillus acidophilus, lactobacillus um, um, crispatus, ketacetonis are significantly higher in term samples. But some no, non-lactobacillus taxa like Megasphera, Gardnella, Prevotella are higher in preterm delivering samples. But uh, one lactobacillus species we have found that is lactobacillus inners, it's significantly higher in preterm samples. So from that we can understand there is a heterogeneity in uh, between term and preterm delivering mother's vaginal profile. Our next aim was to understand their community structure, how they interact to each other in uh, preterm and term vagina. So we have performed co-occurrence network analysis. This was done in OTU level. First we have uh, Dump, uh, done uh, uh, correlation between OTUs and then we have uh, visualized this the interaction plot here each of the color is the same uh, uh, OTU in the same group here the orange color denoted the lactobacillus OTUs here we can say that uh, lactobacillus inners are only interacting to each other in preterm samples compared to term samples whereas this color denoted as the lactobacillus crispatus from here, we can say that in term sample, lactobacillus crispatus interacting to each other more compared to preterm samples. And uh, to understand the longitudinal, how these bacteria are uh, longitudinally uh, shipped to uh, from term and preterm. So we have performed linear mixed effect analysis and we have found crispatus and genesine significantly higher in term sample in all the trimester, but inners is higher in preterm samples. So this is the all over uh, the in broad level uh, function of the lactobacillus. It can uh, protect vaginal uh, environment against foreign pathogen by producing various type of uh, uh, hydrogen peroxide and bacteriocin. But not all lactobacillus has same functions. Like here we can say that lactobacillus genesine and crispatus and inners both are responsible for lowering the vaginal pH but they did not uh, produce the same kind of lactic acids. The Jensini and crispatus mostly synthesize the uh, D uh, isomer of the lactic acid, whereas L inners produce mainly 
l lactic acid and uh, from literature i have found that if we treat d lactic acid in the cervical cell epithelial cell culture model then it can uh, protect this cell to infect infectious agent like chlamydia is one of the uh, infectious agent for std uh, infections but when uh, they treated the l lactic acid then this infections uh, cannot happen so we, we can say there is a difference in their uh, functional composition although they both responsible for lowering the vaginal ph so then uh, i was trying to understand what is the functional profile that uh, in our study so i just only uh, predict the functional property in community level in our study so i have found some uh, uh, bacterial uh, pathway that is significantly different between tarm free tarm so tarm sample mostly are associated with the sucrose degradation pathway but in pre tarm two uh, pathway i have found interesting interesting that is him uh, biosynthesis anaerobic pathway and tryptophan biosynthesis and from literature i have found that this both uh, this pathway are somehow related to inflammation inflammatory condition but these are only predicted uh, predicted uh, pathway so our next aim was to understand actual pathway that present in the microbiome data so we are we have planned to do a shotgun metagenomic study to understand the microbiome gene, the microbiome gene family and pathway in our study in our samples so already we have selected some of the samples to do shotgun sequencing and only 15 study uh, already uh, sequenced till now and uh, we are doing the shotgun analysis and uh, besides this microbiome some clinical factor also important so uh, some of uh, from them i want to highlight one that is cervical length cervical length is a length from vagina to the uterus so it so in previous study showed that this reduced cervical length uh, associated with the adverse pregnancy outcome so it is also important to study cervical length and microbiome association so we are also involved to do a clinical microbiome study in uh, here so uh, this is end my talk so this some glimpses of my award uh, so i have awarded externally internally both so uh, i got young investigator award uh, from my uh, uh, india probiotics uh, foundation so and uh, lastly i would like to acknowledge our director sir uh, or professor indu mitro and uh, ppm sir who is national science chair and founder of the nibmg and one of one of the major collaborator in this project my mentor dr shobhik mukherjee and all the participants of the garbhini cohort and all, all the members of my lab and the ngc for sequencing the microbiome data and uh, department of biotechnology for uh, projects uh, funding and uh, csir ugc for providing me fellowship thank you any questions Okay, so uh, now I would like to invite uh, Dr. Suman Pine to talk about human oropharyngeal microbiome dysbiosis in SARS-CoV-2 infection. So he completed his PhD in the field of biochemistry from IPJMER, and he also got a uh, Young Scientist Award from ICMR DHR. So his research interest lies in the field of uh, complex disease microbiome, and uh, currently he is working uh, with Dr. Anulabha Vasu as project manager in Genome India project. So over to you.
So good evening and thanks to Vic for organizing the event that is World Microbiome Day. And from on behalf of uh, Genome India, I am going to present uh, uh, our work during our lockdown period of uh, second wave of the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, today I am going to discuss about uh, one part that we have done uh, and other parts also like uh, immunological dysbiosis as well as uh, microbiome dysbiosis. But today I am only focused on oropharyngeal microbiome dysbiosis uh, for SARS-CoV-2 infection. So if we uh, go for the epidemiology, uh, so who are the affected individual in COVID-19 pandemic? I think entire globe is affected. Either if not infected, they are affected psychologically or economically or um, and also in, uh, clinically. So yeah, in the globe, there is uh, around 500 million people till now affected and about uh, globe 6 million uh, million people has been uh, died so far. And India, uh, the scenario of India for 4.5 million. And we can see there is a major five strain is normally circulated till now uh, in this pandemic. Uh, so, uh, so, uh, uh, we all know that uh, so the viral uh, SARS-CoV-2 is a virus, so there is a viral infection, and again there is a, uh, uh, another uh, uh, complication of that SARS-CoV-2. Uh, SARS-CoV-2 is the diarrhea. So then the people hypothesize that uh, there is a severe gut dysbiosis may occur due to SARS-CoV-2 infection, and uh, there, there might be some alteration due to their infection. And people found is there is a massive dysbiosis occurred in uh, gut microbiome uh, for, for SARS-CoV-2 infection. And for clinical uh, symptoms, there is the diarrhea is the major clinical symptoms for the gut microbial dysbiosis for SARS-CoV-2 infection. People also thought that they uh, also uh, annotated about the um, uh, there is a change of the oral microbiome also because entire immune system has been altered due to the SARS-CoV-2 infection. So uh, so there is a whatever where, uh, it is uh, it, it has been postulated why where the mic microbes colonize in our body from skin or gut or uh, or oropharynx or nasopharynx everywhere there might be dysbiosis uh, dysbiosed so. Uh, well, they also found that the oral microbiome uh, tremendously altered due to uh, SARS-CoV-2 infection, uh, but, and uh, and major of the study has been found that the diversity is reduced on, on the infection uh, and healthy control having the higher diversity. Um, so the reduction of the diversity here in terms as a dysbiosis. Uh, and uh, there, uh, there is a study also for because the another another major colonizing uh, area of the SARS-CoV-2 is the nasopharyngeal canal. So nasopharynx is also altered due to uh, uh, their infection and altered immune homeostasis um, that has been already established. But one thing uh, when we uh, so in summary so far, so if SARS-CoV-2 infect. Then the gut microbiota has been uh, changed, oral microbiota has been changed, nasopharyngeal microbiome has been changed, but the missing link is the oropharyngeal microbiome. Uh, uh, when we perceive the study, there is a no uh, there is a no report about the oropharyngeal microbiome, but uh, now I think one report is there, and uh, obviously in our report also there. So why uh, the oropharynx, uh, oropharynx is important uh, because the uh, oropharyngea is anatomically most closest area of your lung. So, uh, uh, so you uh, in your mouth, in your nose, you can inhale the air and uh, uh, there is a colonization of the SARS-CoV-2 immune alteration. And among as a part of the consequence of the SARS-CoV-2 infection, uh, uh, it has been uh, uh, observed that pneumonia and respiratory failure is the major cause of death of SARS-CoV-2 infection. But again, it is also true that if you recover the SARS-CoV-2, there is a sudden pneumonia attack and you have uh, the, and we lost several people for that. So there should be a uh, uh, should be a, a, a question in mind that uh, the bacterial dysbiosis, but secondary bacterial infection may occur in the lung. So that, that's why the say uh, the, after recovery, the people are dying due to pneumonia. There is a ample report is there. 
So, so, so if we go in anatomical feature, you can see that uh, uh, in uh, uh, this is the to uh, to inhale from the nasopharyngeal canal to your uh, to uh, to in your lung. It is the uh, one of the most uh, 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 survival technology in the evolution we have achieved. And from there, you can find if hundred breath, if any any hundred breath. Normal people are inhaled through their uh, inhale the air through their nas nasopharynx, and only 10% from the oropharynx. Again, the pressure of the air when you come from the nasopharynx and the oropharynx, the the nasopharyngeal pair uh, it it's accept the gravitational force also. So that there is a power of the uh, air through nasopharynx is much much more higher than the oral cavity. So the frequency of the oral, oral inhalation is less, and the power of the air the nasopharyngeal is high. So nasopharyngeal comes from the oropharynx and from the oropharynx there comes to the lungs. So we, that's why we try to uh, annotate the uh, architect, the microbial architecture in uh, oropharyngeal because uh, lung is uh, very hard to sampling. So that's why we choose the oropharyngeal microbiome. So if you uh, go for the chest X-ray uh, and uh, the clinical features, it is a uh, lung pneumonia is uh, accumulation of water due to the inflammation uh, uh, because the alveolar filled with fluid and immune alteration and your respiratory failure. And you can see that there is a chest X-ray report. There is a the common uh, the chest X-ray is cannot differ uh, uh, for which is the viral pneumonia and which is the bacterial pneumonia. So this is very hard to uh, uh, hard to uh, distinguish uh, between the virus and bacteria. And in uh, uh, epidemiological data, there is a virus and bacteria is equal important for your lung failure due to pneumonia. And there is a, some report about the fungus. I think the country like India having uh, the huge burden of the fungal pneumonia, but the epidemiological study is very, very weak for that. And 2% cases of radiation were occurring the chemotherapy or cancer, they are getting uh, the pneumonia. So the major pathogen is the virus and bacteria and underestimated part is the fungus. So here, uh, so that's why we try to explore uh, is uh, oropharyngeal microbiome altered due to SARS-CoV-2 infection? If it is altered, how long it our body takes time to regain uh, re, uh, regain their uh, healthy like uh, oral oropharyngeal microbiome these two uh, two questions will be uh, formulated and we done a longitudinal study and here uh, due to uh, uh, and again we are very uh, the, uh, this, uh, in the, in our design we are very stringent about our uh, sample collection because if we cannot uh, we don't want to mix the hospital based uh, the hospital cases and the home isolation so which uh, here because there is a hospital contaminant is a major problem we can't find out the exact dispersion so that's why uh, we use the home isolation patient and we uh, the sampling has been done by uh, icmr rmr Sri bhuvanesh um, uh, the director of this uh, of that institute is our collaborator for that study uh, uh, and the all sampling is done in the icmr rmrc campus because they have the minimal socioeconomic uh, uh, difference they are taking the minimal environmental difference because the same water source, same environment they are taking at they are all employed. So, uh, so we in this way we try to match our samples. Uh, so uh, this uh, this way we uh, uh, we collected around 20, uh, 20 subjects. Uh, from day one and obtain controls, uh, we uh, we follow them up among the cases only in three time point. Uh, and 20 cases, uh, uh, why we use the day one? It might be clinically, it might be, may not be the day one. Day one means the people are um, uh, uh, not uh, developing, uh, just developing symptoms or may not develop uh, developing symptoms. They are in close contact. They, they having their own facility to diagnose uh, the testing facility in their own in-house and their um, um, uh, they have uh, well equipped for the primary treatment also by giving the uh, primary support of oxygen and all these things. So that's why they need not to, to go to any hospitals. So, uh, 
they are, few of them are went to hospitals but we are fixed who are not uh, we, in our design who are not uh, went to hospitals who are in the home isolation and we found that 20 cases are from uh, april to may in this time and you can see that is uh, all red means is the affected individual day 15 again they have done a test it some 12 people are not cleared the virus and eight people are cleared the virus in day 15 and day 30 all are clear so we take the oropharyngeal swab in every three time point so in our in our study the we are, this is our demographic activity that is the uh, 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 average age of the age group we have measured uh, around uh, female is uh, it's in red in color and uh, male is the uh, uh, ash uh, in, uh, uh, i have uh, pointed out here and this is the status of the rtpcr positive you can see there somebody is th uh, two three times negative positive somebody is a two times positive so in this way the, uh, uh, well, we are not uh, going to uh, uh, tell as a long covid or short covid because in the paper there is a long covid means the more than one month or two months or so so that's why uh, we uh, make us a group as who cleared the virus within the 15 days who not cleared the virus uh, within the uh, as a group b uh, who not cleared the virus in 15 days. So this is the clinical status means the severity in terms of WHO guideline on that time because every every pen every way we have found there is a guy changes in guideline. This is the guideline according to April and May uh, 2020 21. So this is the status of the figure cough uh, uh, SpO2 uh, and this is we have Charleston comorbidity index because among the patient there is a one quantity variable we can measure uh, from their comorbidity uh, index uh, calculator and we calculated that and this is the antibiotic usage majorly they are used the azithromycin and doxycycline that was um, that was a treatment regime for SARS-CoV-2 infection. And you can see the, our data in uh, in the right hand side. Uh, this is the yeah, this is our healthy control. You can see there is a two major color. One is uh, green and one is red. And here you can see the entire thing is red and uh, one, uh, two, uh, one, two, three individual are yellow. And here is the uh, uh, at the day of 30, one individual rise of the uh, the green color. So green color means the pharmacutes and uh, red color means uh, is uh, denoted as a proteobacteria. You can see the huge shift of the microbiome profile in every three, each three point. And here is, it is a mixture of you can see some are A and some are B. You can see there is a B is also red and A is also red in all time point. That means in 30 days uh, it any of except this individual, any of the individual cannot uh, move to adult like structure it is in the phylum level so massive change occurred in the in your oropharyngeal microbiome due to sars cov 2 infection and at least 30 days you are not uh, acquired the adult like oropharyng oropharyngeal microbiome so these things uh, sure, sure. It, it is a uh, significant observation from our study uh, so pharmacutes uh, it is a uh, pharmacutes is depleted because green is pharmacute in the cases you can't see the green much and uh, the, uh, we have uh, computed the uh, Shannon diversity in the index. This is in terms of entropy of the, your microbiome. You can see that uh, the stability or the diversity is decreased among the cases compared to control. So your diversity is reduced and it is unstable um, in, because the entropy is re reduced. And we further we have computed with the days and you can see uh, this is the healthy control and this is the day one and after that in day 30 it is uh, less uh, the, it is uh, reduced down compared to first day and hc so in th day 30 your oropharynx is uh, another uh, vulnerable for uh, this versus smart because so the more vulnerable um, uh, more um, uh, uh, more vulnerable compared to day one or day 15 so this is our uh, this is the beta diversity. This is our control. You can see we have made the A and B. A is uh, RT-PCR positive after for 15, uh, 15 days and RT-PCR negative in 15 days. You can uh, we can all see that is uh, no uh, no red or blue bar come closer to the healthy like structure except one. That means that pharmacutes who are uh, spread out their green. So so in um, in up to 30 days there is a. Uh, uh, 
uh, significantly distance uh, um, in terms of jacket diversity and also we got compared the break out is diversity also so um, there are distances much much more higher not uh, in 30 days people are not gaining their uh, uh, healthy like structure this is our genus uh, we have found you you can see that majorly this is a hemophila slepsiella and uh, streptococcus the major genus in healthy control but here you can find the enormous number of uh, uh, other bacteria we are nowadays it is very difficult to say that is the good bacteria or bad bacteria because every organ uh, having the different organ specific bacteria and some or uh, some bacteria may uh, uh, beneficial in your gut but maybe detrimental to your orofaring so you can but for the the things i want to point out here that you can see that some bacteria like klebsiella and other they are present in a few samples but every individual is highly different from others that means the higher inter individual dysbiosis passes the dysbiosis pattern is not uniform we cannot articulate a uniform pattern who are affected with the sars cov 2 so one person is different from another person and uh, then uh, and again is this bacteria is good or bad Epidemiological data is saying long term secondary bacterial infection related pneumonia uh, in the evidence in multiple papers so it might not be uh, uh, the uh, beneficial things for to alteration of this bacteria and uh, and we try to uh, uh, try to explain all each of the bacteria i will give a one or two example for that if it is uh, how much closer that bacteria to uh, uh, to be you susceptible for the pneumonia uh, so i am uh, oh uh, and the, this is uh, one uh, our measures. The, these are mainly bacteria for uh, which are um, which are uh, uh, these uh, Streptococcus, Haemophila, Velionella. This is a two. This is majorly abundant in uh, healthy control. And for cases, the uh, proportion of the Chirotia bacterium, Enterobacteria, Serratia, Stenotrophomonas. These are bacteria upregulated. So uh, I will give a two, uh, two, uh, two example of a certain bacteria which I found. You can, uh, there is a functional study is there. If a uh, if person is going to hypoxia, uh, then uh, the colonization of intervector species uh, has been reported. And we found there's a, we have uh, uh, among the six individuals, six, uh, yes, six individuals, only one, two, three, four, five individuals having a sphere to 90, uh, they are acquiring the intervector species. So, um, so uh, due to uh, uh, having uh, the lower SPO, so our uh, we uh, we replicate the same postulation: the hypoxia in uh, hypoxia induced condition, uh, intervector may be colonized in your orofaring, and intervector is also reported as a, uh, a pathogenic potentiality for the lung pneumonia. And and this is uh, another two that is the Serratia and Stenotrophomonas. Uh, I made it is uh, Stenotrophomonas. This color this color is resemble with this uh, Stenotrophomonas. Steratia is the ash color. You can see some ash color is there. So these are already annotated from the postmortem sample uh, from autopsy report. Uh, uh, these two bacteria already reported as uh, uh, pneumonia causing bacteria due to the hemorrhagic bronchopneumonia and uh, Steratia is for diffuse alveolar damage and it, it, uh, uh, consequently it goes to the lung failure. So uh, so that, that two bacteria is also present in higher abundance one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight individuals. So uh, uh, there is a there is a uh, this uh, line is lot i am uh, i am not going to the further uh, detailing of the all other bacteria but this is the trend of your oropharyngeal microbiome in sars cov 2 infection so it is again uh, you can see that is uh, it is in uh, the rmrc icmr the uh, compass uh, they are following the guideline for h and every guideline of icmr all the people are getting the antibiotic either azithromycin or doxycycline but you can see the report card of the antibiotic. You are not acquiring any good bacteria at all uh, or healthy, or it cannot help in regain of your healthy like oropharyngeal microbiome for uh, um, uh, after, ge after getting your antibiotics like what uh, the treatment regime is approved by the WHO and ICMR. So we have to think on that. And this data we have recently published from the Genome India team in uh, microbiome. Uh, it is uh, published. I accept it, I think, within a 
15 days or 20 days if you, if you want to further details of the entire bacterial list and how it is having the pathogenic potency you can go for, uh, from this paper in coming days and another impor important question uh, nibmg is going to solve so we i think uh, is working on that uh, we will see the the uh, we will get the answer for that that uh, what is the difference so oropharyngeal dysbiosis occurred in sars cov 2 infection we we ha have collected the samples when the delta variant is circulating in india around more than 90% and oh, and for so big it is a omicron so we can um, uh, we can uh, differentiate we can get the knowledge about the how omicron dysbiosis pattern and the, is there any similarity or dissimilarity is there so it it that question will solve by the nibmg very recently and this is uh, thanks to all academic member and the directors and this is our team uh, the uh, uh, in, uh, these are in uh, genome india team and this is devashish who helped me ask a lot for different analysis and this is our collaborator uh, dr shangamitra poti from icmr msc bhubaneswar and uh, data generation team uh, from national genome export and he is the st uh, phd student ushaken who had done the main sampling and the isolation so the major credit goes to her so that's it for our official micro -watch. I didn't understand how you decided the day one. Oh, so day one is decide, decided uh, the it's like that way. Yeah, they are the frontliner in the SARS-CoV-2 uh, period because they are they having that their uh, viral diagnostic uh, research laboratory is there in their campus. When they are in close contact or uh, symptoms first appear, they went to the, that day and immediately they are treated because they are the worker for that time. So they should be separated out. So, so that way, these are the day one. Day one might be one to three days, not more than that on that time. Is it possible? That was, that was positive. It is the first diagnose positive. They are all uh, COVID worker on that time. Oh, increase in entropy. That means uh, so. Sir, if uh, if the diversity is reduced, then uh, uh, then your uh, the alteration of uh, from so suppose you have a reduced diversity of the bacteria. That means reduced uh, number of species in your org uh, organ. Then you, uh, the uh, the ch alteration ch chance of to all shift of that bacteria, uh, if the diverse serum diversity uh, of entropy is reduced, the shift chance of the shift of the bacteria is very high. If your species abundance is higher, then the entropy is increased, and uh, the chance of the shifting of that bac uh, bacterial ecosystem on on that specific organ is uh, less. So that's why it is stable. Much more high, higher means the stability is higher. A uh, lower means the stability is lower. That's it. No, we are uh, we are uh, we are not check up in uh, after the thirty. We are. Uh, Yes. And, uh, you that, uh, that particular, uh, when they get... Yes, uh, introvector is uh, it is uh, nothing to validation because uh, I am telling that a hypoxic condition introvector is upregulated. And here among the eight uh, subjects who having the uh, who have to give the oxygen support, among the eight, uh, five are getting uh, introvector. Uh, they are getting the uh, uh, ele elevated proportion of the introvector. So this is uh, uh, the observation. Yeah, yeah. So, 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 uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I, I got your, uh, I got your question. So, if it is, uh, if the senator permanent and senator present, are there any 
they are um, among the among the our individual among the eight individual they are going to they are any uh, any friends of uh, symptoms of pneumonia or any clinical uh, pneumonia has been observed or not till th 30 days uh, it is not uh, and uh, we try to link i am telling you uh, the observation is like that way if Stenotropomonas and Ceratia is your oropharyngeal microbiome and is persist for more, longer period of time with elevated level, then you, you might be a vulnerable situation to develop pneumonia because these two bacteria are already clinically established by uh, uh, post, uh, post mortem or auto autopsy. These two bacteria identified as a potential candidate for uh, hemorrhagic bronchopneumonia and diffuse uh, alveolar, uh, alveolar damage and subsequently lung failure. So the, uh, these are the observation, and from um, from among our sample. Among the 30s, only one sample, uh, they acquired the water in the lung uh, in uh, day 15 and day 30, and uh, but no other people are not developing the immune, uh, pneumonia until 30 days. I think we should take more Okay, so uh, now I'm requesting our director, Dr. Indam Moitro, to give his valuable uh, comments and conclude the seminar. So I, I am sure uh, Sovik has uh, uh, formal vote of thanks lined up, but before that, may, may, may I add uh, my sincere thanks to a good friend, Dr. Sandeep Pal. Sandeep is a friend of the Institute. Uh, we have worked together in the systems medicine cluster and uh, in various ways he has come in various capacities and helped us. So uh, that's that is a real pleasure. We have two other young speakers who gave showed off their data and the findings that are going on in microbiome. That was also pretty exciting. Uh, as you are aware, I mean, they reflect, they gave a glimpse of two very important programs of the Institute. One is the Grand Challenge program on preterm birth, where we are working on genomics, epigenomics, and microbiome of underlying underpinnings of uh, preterm birth, which is a big health problem, particularly from Southeast Asia and in India in particular. <clears throat> the other one is uh, COVID. Everybody of you have heard that we, I mean, we are one of the front running organizations conducting active uh, sequencing surveillance of SARS-CoV-2 and nested among these various activities and research on COVID-19. Uh, one was what Schumann presented. They had been pursuing separately and uh, it, it gave us a I mean, so contribution on NIBMG during the pandemic and understanding the pandemic has been enriched by such initiatives along with the sequencing surveillance. Uh, if I don't have to say much, uh, I just need to close down. Thank you all for speaking, asking questions, being here. And uh, microbiome is a very important part of uh, uh, NIBMG's research mandate uh, because we spend our days understanding the three genomes of human health. One is the nuclear genome, the mitochondrial genome, and the microbiome. And we know now that these are not static. They interact amongst each other and the way they interact and the nuances of their interaction actually determine our health state or our disease. Uh, I thank, but before I thank, I must mention that we, today we have also uh, members of the industry uh, who had been visiting us and kindly uh, joined our audience and, and to my responded to my invitation, Dr. Anirvid Sarkar from Agrivet and his colleague. Uh, welcome, welcome to NIBMG. Hope we will have more such visits from you. Thank you very much. So we now come to the concluding session of the of the mini symposium. And on behalf of the entire organizing committee, I extend a very hearty gratitude to Professor Arindam Moitra, uh, who has given his ardent support in helping us organize this event within a very short time and all, also, you know, uh, inspiring us because we thought to make it a lab uh, or a thing like we are thinking of celebrating the microbiome day in our lab only. But uh, when I conversed with him, he told me, why not do you involve the entire institute? Because microbiome is a very important part, an integral part of our mandate. 
so we also thank uh, dr shundeep pal uh, to to uh, you know uh, for de delivering this microbiome day lecture and he agreed in a, in, in a very short time i called him up and he agreed in a very short, short time thank you for coming i know you are busy in the exam duties and so we have to do it in the afternoon but uh, it's very very encouraging that you came and gave a very illustrious lecture on the microbiome and i think the students here those who are not working in the microbiome field they also felt enticing uh, i also thank the other speakers dr suman pain my friend and uh, my student miss uh, moshumi uh, we we they actually highlighted the microbiome research happening in nibmg at, at present last but not the least dr alpana i thank you very much you did a uh, humongous working getting all the administrative and financial and every other types of clearances because i was busy in these uh, phd interviews and you're constantly you know uh, helping us in uh, organizing these type of workshops i will thank shankho i will thank ankita uh, shankho has made these slides that i showed and ankita for hosting this conference and shobhik he he's, he's also playing a part uh, in the back background i i also uh, you know thank the willingness of our it administration and finance uh, de department to help us in successfully conducting this event within a very short time all the clearances have been obtained within a couple of days only and uh, i am thankful to them for that i hope this mini symposium has been able to generate deep interest in the human microbiome research and we promise to keep this mo momentum ongoing by engaging in collaborative research ventures within and outside nibmg in future thank you thank you very much Yes, yes. 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 Y